So good morning to all of you and uh, welcome to this session uh, on rapid mobilization of India's manufacturing to combat COVID-19. Um, we have uh, several experts here to discuss this. Uh, I will, uh, you can actually see their names and their affiliation by clicking on the, um, on the, uh, uh, the screen. Uh, I'm not going to go through the uh, CVs because uh, you can find that actually on the uh, website of Oasis. Um, and uh, only we have only 45 minutes, so we, we would rather spend time on the meat of the subject rather than going through all the introductions. I said that we have a number of uh, specialists, um, uh, but actually I'm not sure one can be a specialist on uh, what's going to happen in face of the uncertainty that was created by the pandemic. This is such a unique uh, experience and a unique event that we can't fall back on experience from the past or research. Um, what happened 100 years ago with the Spanish flu is probably not relevant to what we are uh, living through today. Uh, but from my perspective, and I'm a professor of uh, operations management at the Singapore Management University, uh, from my perspective, perspective as a specialist on global manufacturing, I personally think that uh, this COVID-19 crisis probably will accelerate a number of underlying trends that were already uh, present before uh, we had this pandemic. And I would sort of say that um, the three or four things that I see, that is first of all, of course, the more rapid deployment of digitalization uh, in all its forms. Secondly, I think many of us have discovered that our supply chains, uh, partially as a consequence of uh, these just-in-time systems, lean manufacturing, etc., have actually become quite fragile, and that uh, there will be a call for more robust uh, supply chains, in particular for strategic product, uh, products such as uh, pharmaceuticals or uh, health-related products, but also, I think, for food and other uh, products that are considered by many governments to be uh, strategic. Thirdly, um, in the big areas of consumption, uh, people have made a very rapid move towards online retailing and have been, to some extent, uh, spoiled by online retailing, i.e. they can get a very high variety of products online and overnight delivered. Um, this is something that consumers have rapidly uh, gotten used to, and they will expect that in the future too. And so one can expect that for some products, at least for finishing factories, factories where you do the last step in the production process, that also uh, there, there will be some reshoring or near nearshoring to large consumer markets. Um, that of course will have impact on costs and that probably will have to be overcome by more automation, uh, in, in particular flexible automation. And then my fourth point is that you see, of course, that uh, the USA-China trade conflict will obviously have impact on the global footprint of companies. Uh, I read uh, in preparation for this uh, session that quite a few people in India have actually um, indicated that the dependence on the Chinese uh, factories is too high and that we have to reduce that dependence. It's very clear that the rising um, uh, protectionism is maybe not a word, but the rising nationalism uh, around goods and services, uh, of which the USA-China trade conflict is perhaps the most important, but not the only one, will actually lead to a, a change in how the footprint of global manufacturing is going to um, uh, organize. I don't belong to the people who think that global manufacturing will be reduced. I think we still will have plants all over the world that are working in a network. But I believe that the design of that footprint, the design of those global um, uh, manufacturing footprints will change. We also know that in the uh, COVID-19, there are some winners and some losers. Uh, clearly, the tourism industry and the air uh, lines have lost a lot. Uh, the telecoms, or perhaps more the 
uh, online uh, based uh, products and services have uh, gained a lot. Um, and I hope that in the discussion that we can will start now that we can actually think about this idea of um, COVID-19 is going to accelerate uh, underlying trends. What were the long-standing issues, trends that have impacted the uh, evolution of manufacturing in India and how, as I said, will COVID-19 influence that? And secondly, I hope also by the end of this session that we will be able to get to the question of what measures need to be taken uh, in terms of policies. So, uh, gentlemen, uh, I'm going to go through uh, the list here. Start with uh, um, Amit, uh, who is Managing Director and CEO of Tata Consulting Engineers, uh, linked to a large company. Amit, four minutes. Thanks, Professor. Uh, I think you've, you've brought in some interesting uh, points. The COVID pandemic has brought forward a few critical and fundamental areas to think about. While India will take its own response and approach towards handling this event, uh, a lot will indeed also shape up a line to how various economies and value chains respond to this uh, event globally. And the answer to this uh, is uh, going to be shaped very differently amongst uh, players in India and outside. Uh, now, having said that, I think uh, the, uh, the, the clear factors on this would be related to how uh, India responds to certain of these elements, um, especially in manufacturing, which has three connotations. Um, first one being uh, related to, am I audible? There's some... Yeah, yeah, it's fine. Okay. So, uh, the broader context of this is that this has happened uh, not in an isolated manner, but amidst a shift in energy source, a trend towards electrification and hydrogen economy, but also amidst an intense geopolitical realignment, a rise of nationalism and the advent of technical advancement. As we leave from industry four to industry five within a decade, our economic cycles are shrinking from 25, 30 years time frame to a decade or less. And similar technology is pushing value chains, markets and industries to innovate and transform. So, having laid this context, coming back to the question, um, where does India figure in all this? I think for the baseline, just prior to this pandemic, India was inching back to its peak growth trajectories after some systematic and much needed reforms. These were bold, ambitious and brave moves and had set up strong growth foundations from the Solar Alliance leadership to shift to renewables to infrastructure reforms with smart cities, water management, enhanced focus on urban transportation and rise in agriculture output. Now, um, there was also a feeling of uh, connectivity, physical, virtual, overall feeling of well-being. And yes, a few industries uh, aligned with global disruptions were struggling, such as automotive, airlines, to core sectors such as metal mining and maybe the impact of reforms on certain banks in India. However, the convergence of many forces, current geopolitical situation at our border and the painful realization globally that we need balance and sustainable supply chains has indeed posed some questions in the Indian leadership and thought process. I foresee a shift to cluster-based industrial hubs, leveraging a holistic and broad interconnect ecosystem, value chains, and enabled with digital technologies. I feel the new normal will also accelerate India's responsible commitment towards the sustainable development goals that India has signed up. As regards recovery, current analysis seems to indicate not before quarter four, that's Jan, March 2021, but could be even delayed for the next 18 months. And it will be sector specific and very uneven and unbalanced. My best bet for India return to pre-COVID times would be 18 to even 24 months. On the topic of make in India with the dynamics and events shaping future plans, I think it will be a blend of make in India and made in India. I more thrust and focus on local indigenous innovation products and process creation and manufacturing. I have a positive feeling that this time India will focus on balanced approach versus make and made. And it will have far-reaching sustainable impact and positive outcomes in years to come. On the workforce, both the tech savvy shaping the virtual world and the brick and mortar blue collar at construction sites and manufacturing sites will shape up differently in India. Our IT workforce has continued to perform and deliver services globally with seamless transition and adoption to work from home. And this shows solid foundation of the Indian IT industry and its sustainable and resilient structure. While the manufacturing sites have had some impact, the workforce at factories are local and in situ and hence stable. It's the demand that is still weak, but the sector can deliver and rebound back 
quite rapidly and in tandem with the demand. So I think the most critical realization that this event has made India realize is the system reforms required for migrant labor class working at our construction sites as India focuses on it, infrastructure development. A systemic reform of organized, unorganized sector, especially related to the construction sector, will be driven by policy and refined labor laws. Uh, as a developing nation to enhance the demand and restart the economy, among the most important factor is infrastructure development. And I think this is where the government will put in extra efforts. Finally, towards the end, I feel the leapfrogging from industry 4 to 5 will shape up in India with use of low-touch economic principles, 4G to 5G. And I think we have all have had a pit stop. The thinkers, innovators, investors, the policy makers. And I think from here, there will be better things to look forward to. I am quite optimistic of how India responds to this and comes out in the post-COVID era. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you. I'm going to switch to, uh, I thought the, the ideas that you had about uh, and your optimism are very interesting. I'm going to switch to uh, Girish, Girish Bagat, who is a partner of Nogenix, Global Technology Partners. Uh, Girish, four to five minutes. Thank you, Professor. Uh, let me begin my opening remarks with, under this regime, what we need to tackle first. I mean, I think from the point of view, let's pick up three points of Prime Minister's narrative given to the nation. One, let's convert this crisis into an opportunity. Second, let's emerge as a dominant player in the global supply chain. And third, focus on self-reliance. And I think what we need to tackle first exactly fit into these parameters. First and foremost, when we are rebooting our, in, our, our manufacturing capabilities, let's focus on the agriculture sector and the agriculture in the rural sector. The agri sector, as we all know, constitutes rural sector has uh, 65 percent of our of a population living there, but we have only 17 percent contribution to GDP. In this sector, if we are able to focus in, it also will be a, a lifeline for SMEs because that's where SMEs can play a big role and SMEs have to be the backbone for our employment trust and for, for the netful. So here I identify at least two sectors within this agri sector, two subsectors which need to be tackled with, 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 with significant technology injection, and that is cold chain, and, and second is in, in terms of uh, uh, food processing. We've been doing some bits and started, but that's where the challenge is in these two sectors lies of technology injection. Second, let's take up the conventional industries and let's look at what we need to focus within the conventional industry uh, framework. To my mind, I mean, the, the, the spectrum is huge. But I, I would say in order of prioritization, we should look at automobiles and pharmaceutical. I'll talk about automobiles first. The automobile sector, India is fairly up the curve in technology as you know, and it can be in, in a worldwide player. It already is. We almost, uh, we are significant players in the, we are fourth largest, I think, in car manufacturing, seventh largest in commercial vehicle manufacturing. So here, the technology, we are up in terms of the technology delivery capabilities, and it just needs to focus on, on our various other delivery mechanisms so that we can gain our market share in the, in the global scenario. In terms of pharmaceutical industry, this is where the interesting aspect is. We all know that India, India is quite large. I think we are about 40, 50 billion uh, dollar as an industry today, and it's projected to grow about double in the next five years in some of the estimates and projected to go up to 130 billion by 2030. If this is the scope, the challenge here, and again here, India is having the best of the technologies, can improve, of course, but what the challenge really is that we are not self-sufficient in terms of a supply lane. We are today, uh, sizable in the supply chains, in, imports are coming in from China, and issues being what they are, India needs to move very progressively up on the, on the on the curve of self-reliance in this area. Third factor that I would like to focus on is in works on new technologies, that is on robotics. Any new industry that's going to come up, I mean, as, as Amit also mentioned, talking about digitalization, robotics, and so on and so forth, will hugely depend upon robotics. Uh, it will be labor less dependent. So labor solutions will go through the agricultural and food sector, and we use robotics, and this is where we have issues we don't have adequate amount of technologies available in the country here. 
So I would assume that these are the three, four areas that we need to focus on. Okay, in terms of in terms of what policy measures need to be done, I think agriculture sector has been unshackled by the government with the last policy domain. It's just now depending upon how you implement the whole thing. The challenge really is when we go for the manufacturing sector is availability of technical resources. Uh, there could be some other policy measures which I will take off in the next uh, in, in the in the in the next round of conversations. But for now, I will just leave this. We thought that we need to bridge a technology gap, with, and we need to build a technology resource gap in the country to come up the cusp of a manufacturing sector. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you for the emphasis on uh, the agri sector, uh, new technologies, and the uh, automotive and pharmaceuticals. Uh, let me now go to our third uh, intervention, uh, uh, Niraj. Good morning, Niraj. everyone. Good yeah. morning. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. And uh, I think I've got four minutes, and I'll take uh, one minute each and four things that I would like to speak here. The first one being uh, how we got here. And the second one is we're talking about opportunities that we have at this point in time. And third is about some strategies and and the challenges that we have. So. Uh, one minute each. How we got here, I mean, everything has been accelerated thanks to this pandemic. But, you know, I shared this uh, on this platform about 10 years ago, that the way the Indian GDP is structured today, and, and Girish uh, dwelt upon that subject as well, with agriculture's contribution 15, 17, manufacturing around 23, 60% plus is services. I felt in the past and even today that that's a very unstable, untenable uh, pie chart for India. And, and, you know, today at this pandemic, everyone is staring at manufacturing, manufacturing, manufacturing and agriculture. So that draws upon the point that we need to change the mix of our GDP. And if you look at if you look at how uh, migrant labor and all this is happening today, India's growth has to be through employment. There is no other way India can grow. That's a backbone of what we want to do here. Uh, so, you know, if you look at the, the way contributions are of the MSME, the agriculture industrial, India's growth through employment has to be the key backbone of how we want to go and take our country from here. The opportunities, we all know there has been some geopolitical opportunities, some trade barriers. There's been a shift to uh, mitigating risk by large companies worldwide, Japan, America, Canada, Europe. And India has an opportunity to take some of that in manufacturing and agriculture and services sector, whether it's engineering goods, healthcare, you know, toys, uh, textile, some of it. So that's the opportunity we have at this point very, very, very clearly. Uh, in terms of strategy, well, I just said that, uh, you know, we have to go through employment and we are seeing this migrant labor going back and we have issues of how to be get back. So the concept of what we call and has been in the making is the factory on wheels. Imagine that there are light and medium engineering companies and textile companies taking their machines, de de centralizing them to tier three, tier four places where it can be made and the headquarters remain in the big city. You bring them in, you put that together, your quality assurance assemble and ship it out. You will reduce your cost and you will decongest the cities. India and your company will become more competitive as compared to China and other countries that they are doing anyway these things. So that's point number two. Three, uh, some challenges. I wish the government is hearing what I'm going to say right now. Um, capital availability to the MSME sector. I know we talk about this, but please hear it. It is not available as much it is being talked on TV. It is not. So you need to speak, the government needs to speak to the institutions and the bank to really let this go. It is the availability first, Professor, that I'm talking. The rates come later. And this is not happening. We've talked about labor reforms, but this COVID has actually brought out the labor reform challenges again. People are expecting to sit back home and take salaries and wages. And how does the industry work in this uh, thing. So the labor reforms are being able to move away the labor when you know need them must be paramount to India's growth. I do believe that uh, just like Niti, uh, suggestion is just like Niti Ayog had a uh, to application for contact and tracking, they should actually have an app for the MSME sector where they can do businesses using that in a subscription model, whether it is sales, finance or QA, 
I think that will be great. So I'm going to stop here right now for my first thoughts and, and, and take up questions and answers later. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Akil, uh, I don't see you, but if you would be in audio available, uh, are you there? Mm, no. So, uh, um, I mean, uh, hopefully he can connect a little bit later and then I will give him the floor uh, to uh, discuss. But listening to um, to the, um, the discussions, I have the feeling that sort of one of the underlying um, trends is that the structure I mean, uh, Niraj, you said it explicitly, but in a sense, also the two other uh, inter interventions were indicating that the structure of the Indian GDP ha has actually to be uh, changed. Um, uh, Girish, you were referring to uh, the agri-sector. Um, uh, Amit, you were actually talking about uh, sustainability and this sort of combination of make and mate in India. Um, uh, can you comment more on that, or is there, are you willing to comment more on that, uh, Amit, for example? You're uh, mute. Yeah, sure. So I think uh, what this will accelerate, uh, of course, the, we as India had already moved our strategic choices on investments from an FII-driven economy to an FDI with Make in India. This thing will accelerate just like globally, there is a rethink on the supply chain in terms of FDI in strategic sectors where imports have far too long dominated, like pharma, medical devices, a more innovative thrust in India. But having said that, I think the three things I'll borrow from my uh, other uh, speakers here is a systematic labor reform, a strong entrepreneurial driven with a nationalistic youth that has proven itself in IT and digital. And how do you marry this IT and digital to put that in industrial with the digital or the industrial internet of things will get accelerated. And last but not the least, as we do that, I think systematically we'll have to look at the capital employment and generation of that, especially because to revive an economy and create the momentum, the biggest spender, the government of India, would have to push into infrastructure via cities, via highways, via metros, which will then restart and ignite the demand across the core sectors, be it automotive, be it mining, metals, chemical. And I think a combination of the Atmanirbhar Bharat initiative that has been started, as I said, will give a lot of thrust to the make and made in India in a balanced manner. And I think that's wonderful for India, for the youth and the workforce that we have, along with the digital and the entrepreneurial spirit that will be revived. Um, any further comments uh, from Girish? Okay. And yeah, then I, like, I, I would like to just pick up on what, uh, uh, what Neeraj said. And I think that's very right in terms of capital availability as a challenge. Uh, and as, uh, as Amit said that, you know, as we require as we grow up our infrastructure and, you know, expand our manufacturing capabilities across the core sectors as well, uh, capital is going to be a challenge. And I think if you look at it, the fact of the matter is today the banking system is totally incapable of lending long-term debt, period. They don't have the capacity. They borrow short. They cannot lend long. Time and again, they have gone into a mess. So it is a time that the government steps back and kind of have used I mean, with, uh, whether the resources can come by privatization of, or, you know, uh, of these banks, by small stakes sell, but the need is paramount to set up a development financial institution like the, of the likes that we had in the past, which actually spurred the industrial activity way back in the 70s and 80s. So the development financial institutions should be allowed. And, you know, today you have these these resources. Resources could be brought in internationally. Internationally, the trillions of dollars are waiting to be invested in long-term funds. They don't go into project specifics. They would like to develop into an institution. So these DFIs, okay, could be the right trigger to build, build the long-term capital. And if you have the long-term capital, the private capital will follow. Okay, the equity capital will follow. There's no dearth of equity capital. It's just that how do you, how do you leverage it? You cannot have a project funded only by equity. So that is one, I think, one shift that the government needs to take to propel 
the manufacturing sector, irrespective of what sector we are talking about. The second thing that we talked about labor reforms, yes. Indeed, that's another area that we see because I, you know, I have had the advantage in the last 10 years, I brought 31 European companies to India. And I see some of these European companies have plants elsewhere in Asia, including China, Vietnam, and other ways. In the productivity norms are horrendous. We compare horrendously. Things. The machines are the same. The equipments are the same. So what is propelling us? Why is our labor producing lower? Perhaps one reason is that they're not so technically skilled. But I think the technical skill, I was listening to an earlier session where industrialists are taking, inventing, in, investing in the people and bringing them up on the technical skills. The industry is doing that. So what I think lacks is, 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 the, is the reform of, of this labor reform that we've been must talk about, you know, not had the political will or whatever else to implement it. These would be my two comments in terms of the challenge. You know? Thank you. Uh, two comments. One, uh, continuing to what Girish just said. Uh, you know, I truly believe that Indian workforce, and especially in the manufacturing, agriculture, MSME sector, has a very big deficit of soft skills. You know, when I say that, I mean sincerity, the discipline to work and produce, to take up responsibility, what has been given. You know, the large sectors have a measure and report to have a matrix of what they did, but the MSME sector does not. So we really need to bring about the soft skill in the workforce for the MSME sector. That is why our productivity is one to three. I mean, I sometimes feel we do only 35% of what we should be doing with the workforce that I have, as an example. And the second is on back to an opportunity. I mean, I see today, look, it, export imports are always going to be part of the world trade. It's not going to go away. But when you look at India's import, there is a million things we import that are, could have been made 30 years back in India. 30 years back. Don't ask me why we got here. We got here and now we are looking at it and staring at it. Let's not make the mistake again. Second, we're also importing a lot of stuff at three times the price that can be made in India under the garb of quality assurance. I'm being very practical. Both has to stop. Yes, we must bring technology. We must bring things that are required and export things that we can. But we are like, sometimes we just go a herd mentality. We just keep doing. And that's what we need to learn from this time. That let's not repeat our mistakes again and again and again and again. And capital, thank you, Girish Bhai. Thank you for saying this. I think Indian entrepreneurs are smart. You give them the capital, long-term debt, they will make it happen. Thank you. Um, I got, yes, um, um, Amit. Uh, Professor Neeraj and Girish, I think I want to add one more dimension to India, and that would, would you know, change uh, post COVID. And that is the default option of cost arbitrage of Indian labor. The very fact that the cost arbitrage drove many of the business plan and strategies will require an overhaul because now, whether it's the labor at the construction site or at the manufacturing shop floor, we will need less of them. And hence, we'll have to train them. The hierarchical, hierarchical sense of working will change to more hello crazy with more responsibility and accountability. So there'll be a big training opportunity to revive. And what the Indian IT industries and workers have done globally at a benchmark level will replicate itself to the manufacturing and construction sector. And that's where I think India is uniquely poised to leverage our IT promise and the digital promise with the youth of India taking up this productivity challenge and actually saying that the cost arbitrage is legacy, belongs to a dinosaur era, and the post-COVID will accelerate this transformation. And that's why I feel very optimistic about the future. Thank right. you. Um, we have about 60 people in the room, 63 now. Um, if uh, you want to ask any questions, uh, ladies and gentlemen, please don't hesitate to use the chat function. And I have in the chat function a question about uh, from Thomas Wu uh, about uh, the opportunities for foreign investors in, uh, in India, whether uh, the change after pandemic will actually lead to a uh, more in to, to an interesting environment in India, uh, and he is referring, among others, to the automotive industry for foreign investments. Any comments from your side? Yeah. 
Yes, can I yes, add on that? Can I pick on that? Uh, I think India policy framework on inviting foreign investment is very, very progressive. But I think in, they have recently amended, in, uh, you know, investments even allowing going up to defense in the 74 percent and therefore. So just about every sector, a foreign company can come and set up a facility here, a manufacturing facility or even just a commercial facility and have a 100 percent stake into the businesses. To say India is actually promoting, there were some questions from Thomas Wu here on terms of mobility, uh, on, on terms of automotive sector, mobility sector is 100 percent allowed. The Indian, should they want to be a 100 percent player, they can be so. Should they want to be a minority player, they can be so. The question that arises here is not just about the ownership. The question that arises here is about IPR, a point we've not touched upon. I think foreign companies, when they come to India, they want to see whether a judicial process is efficient enough to protect their IPR. It cannot be another China. Okay, and that is not so. We have the policy framework. We have the mindset not to cheat. We have the mindset to be honorable, but a judicial process is just so slow and tardy. Maybe there's need to reform, reform that judicial reform as well to give the foreigners a comfort. Bring in your new technologies. Bring in a new way to manufacture things. And we will protect, protect you with the IPR policies and with the judicial response in case anyone, you know, uh, 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 does some malfunctioning. Okay. Anybody else who wants to comment on that? I mean, um, uh, just oh, yeah, 10, seconds, 10 seconds on that. Uh, Girish brought out an in interesting point, very, very important point. In fact, India's uh, index uh, on the trust quotient, India stands very high. And, and as he said, people trust Indians and Indian companies, but the judiciary is lagging behind. And to execute that, to enforce it is behind. So that's a great point. Super point. Mm -hmm. Amit, you were actually suggesting that, um, uh, that, there is an, uh, that the cost of arbitrage uh, is not that relevant anymore and that uh, um, manufacturing could leverage the IT promise of uh, India. Uh, could you expand a little bit more on that, uh, how you see that happening? Yeah. So, you know, over the last five, six years with the industry 4.0 lingo catching up, there was a sense of insecurity that actually for a country that has to generate employment, industry 4.0 and the technology with sensors and dashboard would actually go against that particular intent. However, I think there's a balanced approach to how technology enhances productivity rather than decreases employability. Now, here comes COVID as an event, and suddenly a lot of things converge. A demand for high productivity, a local supply chain, a much balanced view to what is a core sector and strategic sector, and how leveraging technology, we can enhance our productivity and also generate employment by expanding the sectorial outlook and the value chains. Remember, we are amid some transformational shift in energy, in EV economy, with the electrification of automotive. So there's disruptions already in the system where things wouldn't have revived. The good news, I feel, is they have accelerated. And, and that's the reason I feel the adoption to digital with Industry 5.0, which is more human form of Industry 4.0, leveraging AI, ML, and the need for employment generation will actually give results. And I already see actually traction in the last four or five months where both public sector and the private sector is demanding technology that can be adopted to streamline their existing operations. That is, how do you optimize your OPEX and to sweat your asset because CAPEX will remain cautious for the next two years at least, if not more and so it's the opex and how do you optimize your opex by leveraging technology and more industry four and five paradigms and generating employment and that's why i'm positive as i said that i think it's accelerated our adoption to these leading work practices as well as accelerating the productivity metrics actually there is a question about how to make manufacturing cool uh, how to make manufacturing attractive to new people because uh, Arup Suchi says, for India to be a manufacturing hub, we need to improve skills, but young people don't want to be in manufacturing. How do we make young engineers look to manufacturing as a career? No, I just want to add, uh, Professor, then I give it to Neeraj and Girish. 
you know, we're dealing with this generation that's tech savvy on their iPads and on their smartphones. Unless we take these devices to the manufacturing floor with better analytics, better dashboards, real-time track and trace, things that we talked about are actually possible with very less investments to recharge your operations and make OPEX, as I said, cool and attractive to this young generation. The more we do it faster, the more real-world employment will start in the virtual world of IT, which we are very proud that we've made benchmark, you know, global forays in that. And I think once we get into this, I think it'll become cool once again to be in manufacturing. You know, uh, can uh, I, if I may, and then Iraq. I, I, I have the experience that when we hire engineers coming from the regional colleges for the manufacturing floor shop, we pay them a pittance. We actually pay them less than what we would pay our domestic help or our drivers. Now, when you pay them so poorly, you are giving a signal out. You are not paying. You, you should be paying for what a job deserves, not because you have excess of engineers available. So when you do that, you're actually undermining and actually killing the impetus for somebody to go into a floor shop engineering job. Because he sees so forever, he, the person comes and then he's looking around for a new job. How can he survive with the 25,000 25, rupees a month? Can he get something better? Can he afford a scooter? So this, this whole challenge, I think, is lies also, also needs an industry mindset. Let's pay to what the job deserves, not, not just cut down on the salary level just because you get too many engineers. You know? Yeah, I think that's a very excellent question Arup Jutsi asked that, you know, it's been a taboo that most people don't want to get into manufacturing. Everybody wants to go into the you know, white collar job. And two things both have already been addressed by my two co-panelists is compensation has been very, very underpaid for engineering graduates coming into the manufacturing sector. Very poor. Now, why do we do that? There's a cause effect because we don't believe in the industry that the quality and the contribution they can make because we are not adopted the technology that they can use to bring more productivity. So it's all interlinked. If we bring technology into the MSME sector as well and not just the large sectors, then the productivity will go up. That will attract more engineering minds to come because they can walk around with an iPad, even in a small sector with 30 people, and get reports. That's what I was alluding to, that Niti Aayog, if one contribution they want to make to this MSME sector is just like they developed an application in just four weeks record time, they should come up with an application which automates the whole damn thing for M MSME. And maybe you can have a subscription by the MSME of 200 rupees or 100 rupees per month or per year. People will pay for it. Give that iPad and make that happen because MSME cannot afford, they don't have the mindset to do it, period. I mean, you were actually at some moment in time also uh, during the discussion referring to the need for infrastructure development. Um, that is always in any country an important part to support manufacturing. But is there anything specific you are thinking of? Yeah, I think if you look at India, you know, we don't enjoy being a reserve currency with the rupee, unlike the dollar or other major currencies. So we can't keep on printing. So how do you, what are the levers you have? You can't get your interest rates down to an extent because you're worried about the rating. So the only lever India has is a large disproportionate in the short term spent by the government to revive the momentum. And where does the government spend in infrastructure? And do we need it? Absolutely. We need a lot of infrastructure in India. And it had started in the last five to eight years. So if we can put the thrust, renewed thrust on smart cities, water management, urban transportation, uh, modernization of our water systems at the rural areas, irrigation, it will restart the momentum and the economic wheel. And when that starts, you'll need more steel, you'll need more construction activity, jobs would happen, and the whole thing gets interconnected. The, the pace of uh, economic return will, 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 fast, will be faster. And as I, as I say that, I feel, uh, if anything, uh, the infrastructure sector can actually lead the economic reforms in India because it's also linked to the labor reforms as we experience with the migrant laborers. And uh, as a consequence of the infrastructure-led growth in India, 
we will see both FII, FDI, and hence manufacturing also going in tandem. So I think for us, I would bet on infrastructure as a key driver to get us back on the track of economic growth. And uh, India is, as a country needs a huge amount of investment. Uh, there is enough business case for it. So as I said, uh, that would be my best bet to get the country back in shape. Any comments from Niraj or Girish uh, on this? Briefly. Okay. Girish, you go first. Uh, I just want to add a new one, a new point here. The challenge for our SMEs are much of them are technology obsolete. They don't have the capital bandwidth to acquire new technologies and organically is not the way forward. Most of the countries in the West have sovereign funds which support acquisitions for these SMEs to buy technologies from outside. Many in Europe, as I see, a lot of technologies are going a begging. The companies are folding up and will fold up even faster now post-COVID situation. This is the time for us to provide some small impetus of 100,000, 500,000, a million euros or so okay, to the SMEs to go out and grab the technologies. They will put their capital as when a 15, 20 person coming in from the sovereign fund will go to make a sea change in the whole attitude of, of SMEs going up the curve on technology. Niraj? Uh, 15 seconds. I think uh, uh, for the MSME in India, uh, even though people talk about global market shrinking and all, our share in the global market of export is so minuscule that I don't think it matters right now whether U.S. is going to buy 5% or 10% less than before. We have, uh, our approach, I think, has I've always advocated for India that export is a very big, important, critical mission strategy to go forward. We have internal consumption, but export has to go, has to go. And one thing which is helping India now and will help in the next two years, as I see it, is the rupee dollar conversions you know the foreign exchange forecasted is 70 you know it's at 75 rupees to a dollar it might go up it's not going to go back to 69 so that's going to give a win in the sale for export i think our sector should focus on exports as well not just look at domestic that we have a big market yes we have but the market outside is so huge and untapped that even in the shrinking market of the global marketplace we can double triple our exports Gentlemen, we have two minutes and a half left. Uh, the system is telling me that if you would like to have one re policy recommendation for the government, what would it be? Uh, you know? My bet would be okay. for, the policy makers, uh, for the policy makers to really look at a balanced approach between make in India and a more promising and confident made in India. And I think the Atmanirbar campaign hints towards this, but I think we should be more explicit on the made in India. I think that's where India can lead post COVID and industry 4.0 and 5.0 transformation. And to support that, provide long term funds, promote DFIs. Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, two quick points. One, I'm very happy that this government is actually leveraging this threat into an opportunity and the whole mood of the country is looking yes. positive, what we can do. That's very paramount. And the second only one thing I say is Indian entrepreneurs are very strong. Capital, 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 capital. Give them the capital, period. They will figure a way out how to manage and navigate themselves. But please give the capital. Thank you, gentlemen. It is always difficult to uh, summarize a very... Uh, rich discussion like the one we have had in this uh, in this panel uh, i got an email by the way from akil that he couldn't get through so uh um too bad for us that we uh, don't have his contributions here but um i wrote for myself a few things down this is not a summary this is sort of things that i really picked up out of the discussion and that is first of all sort of the common uh, opinion that there is actually a need to change the composition of the um of the GDP of India and to do that relatively drastically. Uh, secondly, uh, the word capital has probably been used uh, as one of the most frequent words in the, discuss the discussion, but the availability of capital uh, for in particular the SMEs, but also uh, as Girish was pointing out, perhaps to invest uh, overseas in failing companies and bring technology to India. The third point that I wrote down was 
a real need to invest in skills development, um, not only technical skills, but also soft skills. Um, and in I sort of linked there uh, the, the need to make uh, uh, manufacturing more uh, attractive, but as Amit has pointed out, this is probably a sort of a self-reinforcing cycle uh, once you uh, get uh, in, in the right environment. The fourth point that I wrote down was um, uh, the, uh, the need to improve the judicial environment uh, so that intellectual property rights can be uh, uh, enforced uh, and that, that, in, that actually the infrastructure there is there, but that it's actually the judicial uh, environment that needs to be improved. Um, I wrote also down the idea of decentralization, uh, go to second, third or fourth tier, tier cities, lower the cost by doing so, but at the same time creating employment uh, over there. And then finally, the need to have good infrastructure development. It was a very rich discussion. Thank you very much. And I think that uh, I, we can actually give an applause uh, if you click, uh, click on one of those uh, little uh, icons at the bottom of the screen. I'm going to click on the one that says clap. I don't know what that means then and uh, what it does, but I really think uh, that I should give you under a normal search situation a warm applause uh, for your contributions. Thank you very much, and I hope that manufacturing in India will do well. Thank Cheers. you so much, Professor. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Oliver. Have a great day. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye bye. All of Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, man. Okay, so.